Welcome everyone uh, to this session on uh, Fichte's engagement with uh, early modern philosophy. Um, so I'm very pleased to see everyone. And before introducing the speakers, I'd like to um, mention a few things. Uh, first of all, I'd like to mention that uh, Marco Bassan uh, had to cancel um, due to a family issue. Uh, so um, uh, we are very happy that uh, we, find, we found a replacement. Uh, so Lara Skakria, um, uh, gladly accepted to uh, replace uh, Marco, uh, and she'll uh, give a paper uh, as well. Um, I'm also very grateful to Daniel Bizil, uh, our commentator, um, because he accepted to give his comments uh, on her paper uh, off the cuff. So a few uh, practical matters maybe. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask um, everyone present to switch on their video, uh, if at all possible, because I think it's always nice if, if everyone uh, in the audience uh, can see one another. But of course, if you have uh, reasons not to switch on your uh, camera, that's also perfectly fine. Um, I also wanted to mention that we normally leave open the Zoom meeting um, after the formal uh, conclusion, so that everyone who wants to can uh, continue uh, the conversations. And so if there is a question you were not able to ask, uh, don't despair because there might be another opportunity for you uh, after seven o'clock. Uh, then uh, the structure of this uh, session is going to be as follows. Uh, the three papers will be about uh, 20 minutes each, uh, followed by response by uh, Professor Brazil. Um, after that, the speakers can very briefly uh, respond to uh, the comments and questions. And after that, we'll have a 10 minutes uh, Q&A. Yeah, and as said, um, maybe um, there will be or there will be more opportunities to ask questions uh, later on. And I wanted to ask you to keep your questions uh, short and focused, uh, especially because we have three papers and not um, uh, very long Q&A sessions, okay? Uh, then uh, let me uh, introduce the speakers. Uh, and I will take them in the order in which they are going to uh, present. So um, first of all, uh, Jimena Soleil. Uh, she's a researcher at the National Research Council of Argentina, and she also teaches philosophy at the University of uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, her research focuses on uh, Spinoza, uh, on uh, debates within the Enlightenment and the emergence of German idealism. She coordinates uh, two research groups, one on idealism uh, and one on uh, Spinoza. And since 2018, she is uh, a board member of the International uh, Fichte Gesellschaft. Um, uh, yes, so um, her, uh, her title is going to be um, uh, straightforwardly uh, Fichte and Spinoza. Uh, our second speaker is Esma Kayar. Um, she did her PhD at Istanbul University, and she's currently a research assistant at Istanbul uh, Medinayet University, and also a visiting scholar at the City University of New York. Yes, so she's joining us. Uh, from New York um, at the moment. And her uh, research focuses on uh, Kant and Fichte, in particular their metaphysics, uh, epistemology, uh, and logic. And the title of her paper uh, will be Leibniz and Fichte on the I am. Um, our third speaker today is Lara Skaglia. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Warsaw. Uh, and she obtained her PhD from the University of Barcelona uh, in 2018. Her dissertation was recently published by Peter Lang under the title Kant's Notion of a Transcendental Schema, the Constitution of Objective Cognition between Epistemology and Psychology. So congratulations uh, on this uh, book publication. Her current research focuses on uh, Kant's notion of the Enlightenment and its uh, legacy, and the paper she's going to present today uh, is also uh, on this uh, topic. So the title of her paper is Learning to be at one with oneself, Bildung and Bestimmung in Fichte's account of the scholar. 
And finally, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, Daniel Vizil, who is a professor emer emeritus of the University of uh, Kentucky. And he visited the Institute of Philosophy in Leuven uh, in 2017 uh, during a conference on Rhinol. And I have very good memories of your uh, visits to Leuven uh, at the time. Yes, so hopefully there will be another occasion for us to invite you um, uh, on campus. I'll be there. <laughs> um, Professor Bizil is a renowned specialist of post Kantian idealism and Fisch's work in particular, as you all know. So in that regard, uh, he, uh, his work doesn't really uh, require an introduction. Uh, but I wanted to mention that he is uh, one of the founders of the North American uh, Fichte Society and also of the uh, Fichte Studien. He um, uh, also served the community of Fichte scholars uh, and uh, philosophers more generally by translating uh, key texts uh, by Fichte into English, including the foundation of the entire Wissenschaftslehre and the Wissenschaftslehre uh, Nova Methodo. He has an impressive number of publications, as you all know, and I just mentioned um, one of his books um, titled Thinking Through the Wissenschaftslehre, uh, published uh, with Oxford University Press in, in 2016, which is a book that, um, uh, that is uh, of great help to anyone who wants to um, uh, get acquainted with uh, Fichte's ideas. Uh, I finally wanted to mention um, uh, one paper on uh, Fichte that is particularly relevant to today's uh, topic, uh, and it is titled uh, Fichte's uh, Spinoza, Common Standpoint, Essential Opposition and Hidden Treasure, uh, which was published in 2018 in the Internationales Jahrbuch des Deutschen uh, Idealismus. Uh, so, um, uh, I guess not many uh, Fichte scholars uh, are specialists on the topic we are uh, discussing uh, today, so Fichte's relationship to uh, early modern uh, philosophy, but uh, it is clear that, um, that Professor Buzil is um, uh, among the very few who has studied this uh, subject in depth, and, and uh, I'm sure that everyone uh, is looking forward uh, to his uh, comments. Uh, on, on the papers. So, um, um, Jimena, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Karin, for the introduction and for the invitation. Thanks a lot also, Professor Buisil, for being here and, and reading and for your comments. It's an honor to participate in this session of the seminar, and I will share my screen and read my text along so I don't take up too much time. Mm, so. Can you see everything? Okay, yeah, okay. So I'll just read my text. The title is Fichte and Spinoza, quite straightforward as Karin said. Mm, and I will start. So there is no doubt that Spinoza is one of Fichte's main interlocutors throughout his work. Especially in the works of the Jena period, the discussion with Spinoza holds a central place. Indeed, even before Jacobi's accusation of Spinozism, fatalism and atheism against the Wissenschaftslehre in his famous letter of 1799, Fichte had already been concerned with pointing out the differences between Spinozism and his own philosophy. In the Grundlage der Gesamten Wissenschaftslehre, 1794-95, the first public exposition of his system, he presents Spinozism as the most radical dogmatic system and therefore as opposed to and incompatible with his own criticism or idealism. However, he is also willing to grant Spinoza some philosophical merits and seems to admit certain coincidences between their doctrines. Moreover, in a letter to Reinhold written in the same period, Fichte claims that the Wissenschaftslehre 
can be most adequately explained on the basis of Spinoza's doctrine. Thus, Fichte assumes an ambivalent position towards Spinoza in this early stage of his philosophical development. In this presentation, I will analyze the way in which Fichte introduces Spinoza in the Grundlage, and I do not intend to look for similarities between them, nor to trace the influence of Spinozism in Fichte's doctrine, not to, nor to judge whether Fichte's interpretation of his system is correct. My aim is to illuminate Fichte's understanding of Spinozism in order to determine the role he assigns to him in the foundation and exposition of his own philosophical system. First point, Spinoza as the only enemy worth defeating. The discussion with Spinoza begins in one of the scholia that Fichte introduces after the deduction of the first principle, the absolute self that expresses the Tathandlung, the pure activity of the self, the self's own positing of itself. Fichte intends to show the differences that exist between the fundamental axiom and the principles established by other philosophers before him. He deals with Kant, Descartes, Reinhold, and finally Spinoza, whose position he analyzes at considerably greater length. The interpretation that Fichte offers here, condenses, condensed into a few paragraphs, can be summarized in three theses to which he makes three objections and which, as I will show, allow him to make important clarifications about his own position. This first confrontation with Spinozism will result, as we shall see, in the presentation of his doctrine as the only valid alternative to his Wissenschaftlehre. Thus, Fichte builds a first image of Spinoza as the only enemy worth defeating. So, first thesis. The first thesis, which some interpreters tend to consider as Fichte's definitive position regarding Spinozism, consists in the claim that Spinoza has overstepped the first principle of the Wissenschaftler. To explain the existence of the empirical self, states Fichte, Spinoza appeals to something other than the self. Fichte objects that this search for the foundation beyond the self introduces a separation between empirical consciousness and pure consciousness, which leads to the impossibility of explaining self-consciousness. Thus, this first point of the confrontation with Spinozism allows Fichte to make explicit a vital aspect of his own position. According to him, the only way to explain empirical self-consciousness, which is precisely the task of philosophy, is by rising to the realm of pure self-consciousness, where subject and object are not yet distinguished. The absolute self is, according to Fichte, a necessary identity of subject and object, a subject object. And it is so absolutely without further mediation. This absolute I cannot be separated from the empirical I in which representation actually take place, but rather the latter must be able to access that original act of self-positing, either through the process of abstractive reflection that Fichte follows in the Grundlage, or through intellectual intuition, which he incorporates in the, in the later versions of his system. The absolute self must be posited in the empirical self as its foundation, so that access to the first fundamental principle of the Wissenschaftlerre occurs in the realm of self-consciousness itself. To separate them, as Fichte claims here Spinoza has done, precludes the explanation of self-consciousness and our representations. <clears throat> Second thesis. Immediately after expressing this criticism, and somewhat surprisingly, Fichte affirms that Spinozism is perfectly consistent and irrefutable. 
This claim, which seems to contradict the previous thesis, in fact, follows from it. According to Fichte, Spinoza's system is irrefutable because he takes his stand in a territory where reason can no longer follow him. Fichte's objection points out that by going beyond the pure consciousness that is given in empirical consciousness and establishing a principle that is beyond it without offering any rational argument or proof to support it, Spinoza's system is also groundless. Spinoza's system may be perfectly consistent, but it lacks foundation. Although at this point, the confrontation seems to be directed against the interpretation of Spinozism defended by other thinkers of the time, such as Jacobi, who states the impossibility of refuting Spinoza's system in, in his letters to Mendelssohn, Fichte takes the opportunity to illuminate another central aspect of his own philosophy. Indeed, the first principle of the Wissenschaftlehre is not arbitrarily stated, but the result of a procedure of abstractive reflection that searches for the transcendental condition that make consciousness possible. The establishment of the pure I as the first fundamental principle is the result of a transcendental deduction and therefore cons constitutes an authentic ground. Third, third thesis. Finally, Fichte claims that Spinoza's system is the result of the search for the highest unity in human cognition, which he acknowledges to be present in his system. Spinoza is, in Fichte's view, a speculative thinker who inquires into the foundation of experience and succeeds in rising to the supreme unity, unity which, he claims, we shall encounter again in the Wissenschaftler. While this may sound like a praise of Spinoza's system, Fichte quickly points out the difference between them and makes his objection explicit. According to Fichte, Spinoza believes that this unity is the result of the exercise of theoretical reasoning and fails to see that it is, a real, that is, it is really a practical necessity. While Spinoza's substance is established as something given, as something that exists, the first principle of the Wissenschaftslehre is an ideal set forth as a goal, as something that ought to exist. Spinoza's error is merely that he thought to deduce on grounds of theoretical reason what he was driven to, mere, driven to merely by a practical need. This aspect of the confrontation with Spinoza allows Fichte to emphasize the ideal nature of the Wissenschaftslehre's first principle, which is not to be understood in an, as an existing being, as a thing, as a first cause. The absolute I does not exist, but ought to exist, despite the fact that its actual re realization is impossible, Fichte warns. The interpretation of Spinozism as a speculative system which seeks the highest unity of human knowledge but fails in placing it in a substance that exists by itself and in itself leads Fichte to declare that if we go beyond the I am, we necessarily arrive at Spinozism. Spinozism thus becomes a kind of latent threat Anyone who disregards this boundary and pretends to go beyond the first principle of the Wissenschaftlehre must necessarily reach Spinozism. Therefore, Fichte concludes, there are only two completely consistent systems, the critical, which recognizes this boundary, and the Spinozistic, which oversteps it. The difference between Spinozism and criticism lies then in the fact that they accept completely opposite fundamental principles, a substance which exists beyond consciousness and the absolute self, which is accessible in the realm of consciousness. Both systems are consistent, both are valid, hence Spinoza appears as the main adversary of the Wissenschaftler. 
as the author of the only system worth refuting, since he embodies what Fichte presents as the only philosophical alternative to his own criticism. Second part, Spinozism as a system to be completed by the Wissenschaftler. Fichte takes up again the opposition between criticism and Spinozism a few pages later, after having established the second and third principle of his system. However, we do not find in these pages, as we might have expected, a refutation of Spinozism, nor do we find any new objections against it. On the contrary, Fichte enhances his interpretation of his philosophical rival and radically modifies the way in which he understands the relation between the Wissenschaftler and Spinozism to the point that it no longer appears as an adversary. Now the essence of critical philosophy, Fichte begins at the end of paragraph three of the first part of the Grundlage, consists in this that an absolute self is postulated as wholly unconditioned and sorry, incapable of determination by any higher thing. The Wissenschaftslehre is a system of critical philosophy that proceeds, proceeds consistently from that first axiom. Dogmatic philosophy, on the other hand, equates or opposes anything to the self as such. This is achieved, Fichte explains, by appealing to the supposedly higher concept of the thing, ends, which is thus quite arbitrarily set up as the absolutely highest conception. Therefore, the difference between them lies in the fact that in the critical system, the thing is what is posited in the self. In the dogmatic, it is that wherein the self is itself posited. The third principle of the Wissenschaftslehre that Fichte has just deduced and according to which the divisible self and the divisible not self are posited by the I in the I, allows us to determine more precisely the difference between the two philosophical systems. It is basically a divergence in the way in which each understands the structure of reality. Indeed, Spinoza's system now presented as the most logical out outcome of dogmatism, so far as dogmatism can be consistent, is characterized as transcendent because it goes beyond the self. Criticism, on the contrary, is authentically immanent system in which everything, including the thing, is posited in the self. Now, the explanation that Fichte offers to support this interpretation seems to contradict the first thesis that he had put forward at the end of paragraph one. That is, that Spinoza oversteps the first principle of the Wissenschaftler. And it seems to contradict this last claim, that is, that Spinozism, as any other dogmatism, is transcendent. Thus, in my opinion, what follows radically transforms the image of Spinoza Fichte is constructing in this work. In fact, Fichte now claims that Spinoza does not succeed in going beyond the self, but remains unfailingly in the second principle of the Wissenschaftslehre, the absolute not self. In this sense, Fichte recognizes that dogmatism in general is not at all what it claims to be. This statement, according to my reading, does not constitute a criticism or an objection, but a sort of vindication of dogmatism and thus of Spinozism. The conclusions we have drawn from it have done it an injustice, says Fichte. This is so because its highest unity is indeed no other and can be no other than that of consciousness and its thing is the substance of divisibility in general or of the ultimate substance in which both 
self and not self, Spinoza's intellect and extension are positive. Dogmatism seems to seek a foundation beyond the absolute self. However, in reality, it never succeeds in surpassing it and Fichte admits at its utmost limit, as, a, as in Spinoza's system, it extends to our second and third principles, but not to the first absolutely unconditioned one. Thus, Spinoza, the most consistent of all dogmatic thinkers, would only rise as high as the second and third axioms of the Wissenschaft. According to Fichte, the true principle of philosophy remained unknown to him. It was reserved for the critical philosophy to take this final step and thereby to consummate our knowledge. Fichte concludes. So as a conclusion from Spinozism to idealism. So understood, the difference between criticism and Spinozism does not lie in a genuine divergence of their principles and the opposition raised at the end of paragraph one seems to vanish. Fichte admits that both seek the supreme unity and that both, although Spinoza does not know it, are driven by a practical imperative. The difference then lies in the fact that Spinoza only manages to reach the second and third principles, whereas the Wissenschaftlehre goes a step further and reaches the absolute self. Fichte cannot consider Spinozism, therefore, as a false system, as an alternative entirely opposed to his own, but as an incomplete system, which only the Wissenschaftlehre succeeds in consummating. That is why he can state that the theoretical portion of our science of knowledge, which will actually be evo evolved only from the two latter principles, is in fact, as will appear hereafter, Spinozism made systematic. The Wissenschaftlehre adds to this a practical part, which grounds the first part and completes the whole of knowledge by explaining everything encountered in the human mind. Spinoza is no longer an enemy. It is no longer necessary to refute him. On the contrary, his system is now revealed as a moment of the Wissenschaftler, the theoretical part that considers the world as something given independently of the action of the subject, as something that cannot be modified and is governed by necessary and immutable laws. Spinoza's point of view, the most coherent version of dogmatism, is incorporated into the Fichten system as one of its parts. The Wissenschaftler completes the dogmatic vision, transcendent, fatalistic, and deterministic of reality with the practical part, which shows that all reality is based on the free action of the absolute self. We said at the beginning that Fichte's position towards Spinoza in the Grundlage is ambivalent. His initial effort to distance himself from Spinozism and to point out its defects, which can well be understood taking into consideration the Spinoza Streit as a background of the discussion, is combined with a redeeming effort, which is an, as enigmatic as it is original challenging the widely accepted image of Spinozism as atheistic, fatalistic, and dangerous doctrine, Fichte decides to build a new image of Spinoza, which behind a first layer that portrays him as an enemy, actually hides an ally. If Spinozism is, as Fichte confesses to Reinhold in the letter we co quoted at the beginning, the best way to access the Wissenschaftler, it is because this doctrine does not need to be refuted and discarded, but understood and completed. Spinozism is the ultimate expression of dogmatism, and insofar as it is unacceptable because it abolishes freedom, it works as an incentive to continue searching. It forces us to recognize the need to embrace the Wissenschaftler. 
Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So um, I I don't think that Spinoza would have agreed with uh, Peter's reading of Spinoza, but that's uh, that's another subject. Uh, I turn over immediately to uh, Daniel Pizio. Thank you. I enjoyed your paper very much. Uh, I certainly agree with your conclusion about Victor seeing Spinoza as something of an ally. Uh, but I do have a question about, well, I have three questions. Two questions about your interpretation of Fichte and the uh, one question about Fichte and Spinoza. So I'll ask that question since that's your topic of your paper. Uh, I think you're, I'm not challenging uh, your claim about the positive comments about Spinoza and about how uh, the ethics could be seen as parts one and uh, as the as the first part of the Grunlage, but I do some, think that you somewhat exaggerate uh, the conclusion to draw from that. It's not that no longer requires refuting, because what requires refuting is the claim that the first part of the Wissenschaftslehre is sufficient by itself. That's dogmatism, right? Uh, so I don't. Uh, Fichte continued to criticize Spinoza for the rest of his career. I mean, the later writings are full of, you know, the same kind of claim. But he also continued to say the best way to get into my philosophy is to read Spinoza precisely because it does start you in the right way of thinking systematically in a kind of a genetic derivation method. And also because it makes the need for a philosophy of freedom so evident by denying freedom. So I, I will challenge the claim that they become allies and he doesn't need to refute Spinoza anymore. Uh, it's true that it's part of the Wissenschaftslehre, but part of the Wissenschaftslehre taken to be the whole Wissenschaftslehre is false. So that's my would be my first remark, I suppose. Uh, I also would have a uh, have a questions about uh, two other points in which you interpret Fichte. But let me see. If you, let me stop now and let you respond to that, please. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy and relieved that you think that <laughs> <laughs> that maybe I'm I'm pointing in the right way. You are. Um, I I completely agree. The thing is that maybe the what what we should question it what what would it mean to refute spinozism and i think that there we could also link this question to the problem of how would we refute dogmatism right. and as we know that in the first um, um, introduction written a few years after his Fichte stresses the impossibility of of communication and the impossibility of really engaging in a discussion about the first principles with the dogmatic, I think we could also find there some difficulties about how would Fichte confront Spinoza and how would a refutation of Spinozism look like for Fichte. I so I, I, I agree that the, um, the only path towards a refutation of Spinozism and dogmatism would be to show the necessity of continuing the search for a higher principle for the self self positing for the Tathandlung and uh, searching for this principle that allows a practical part of philosophy and that allows freedom as, as part of a systematic uh, doctrine. But uh, yes, I completely agree that saying that Spinoza should not be refuted does not mean that we should embrace Spinozism and, and stop there. <laughs> now, refutation but, is the wrong word. I shouldn't have said refute. Rejection is the right word. Right? Yeah. Rejection yeah. Is yes, of course. Uh, I, I completely agree. Yeah. Spinozism must be rejected as, as somewhat an incomplete uh, view of reality. But, but, but insofar as it takes itself to be an adequate view of reality, you know, it's a false view of reality. Yeah. That, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. So two, two quick uh, points about the interpretation of Fichte. Uh, you'd say at one point on uh, page five that uh, the absolute eye does not exist, but ought to exist. Um, I wonder how you would uh, respond to uh, Fichte's own comment in uh, paragraph 11 of the uh, second introduction, where he says one of the most common confusions is to confuse the absolute I with which the Wissenschaft's Lyra begins and the I as an idea with which it ends. Seems to me that you have conflated, conflated those two in, the, in saying that, right? Yes. Also, uh, yes, I think that in, in that that uh, claim can, can be misunderstood. Uh, I think that it, the, this stressing of the ideal aspect of the I 
um, which is um, the first principle, but it is also the ideal towards um, human action. Um, but but forward. Say we shouldn't conflate those, we should distinguish those from each other. They're not the same thing. Yes, they are not the same thing. But when Spinoza is confronted by Fichte in, in the Grundlage, the stress Fichte makes is that by, by um, stating as a first principle, a substance and ends something that exists and is, um, is well, it's kind of a ding and sich uh, thing in itself, the possibility of thinking it also as an ideal is taken out of, of the way. So the first principle being a thing that exists and has no development, has no activity, has no life, also kills the possibility of positing this I as an ideal. I don't, I, I think that we can find a lot of, of difficulties in, in this um, claim by Fichte, because of course he is also saying that we must distinguish both. Yes. But when he criticizes Spinoza's substance as first principle, he uses the, um, this uh, ideal aspect of the eye as a key point. So yes, maybe that's that would be, a good question for Fichte. So why is he stressing that ideal aspect when he himself states that they should be distinguished? Maybe the other way around. Okay, so, so, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. So, uh, so Daniel, I think you also wanted to ask uh, maybe one question concerning... One more, yeah, real, 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 quite, real quickly. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I was uh, a little confused by the, the notion of abstractive reflection. Uh, for a way of re reaching the absolute, you, you distinguish that from intellectual intuition and suggest that he begins with the abstractive reflection and then replaces that with intellectual intuition. But I would think it's just the opposite. I mean, are you thinking about the think the wall, think he was thinking the wall, that kind of process? I mean, I don't, what, what do you have in mind by abstractive? I don't find that in the Grundlage. I find it in the Nova Metodo. Yes, I think it in the Nova Metodo is, is, um, is, developed uh, explicitly and in the Grundlage we could find some traces of this yeah. proced procedure being um, tried out but he doesn't speak there in the Grundlage of intellectual intuition. But he does so, in the Gerushchev before that. I mean he, he just leaves. Yeah. I, I, I have an explanation for why he leaves the term out but uh, I, anyway. I'll, I'll stop asking questions. Let the rest of the speakers, the rest of the audience, ask you some questions. Thank you very much. So may, maybe when you. You, maybe when you come and visit us in in Belgium, you can reveal uh, the secrets, <laughs> or uh, <laughs> you can reveal your your ideas on this oh. on this topic. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, the floor is open for um, for further questions to Jimena, and please use the um, uh, the raise hand function. Dino, please. Thank you. I, I, I forgot how to unmute myself, but I hope it works. Um, thank you very much for this. Just a, just a question on uh, Fichte regarding dogmatism. Um, and this is a question from utter ignorance. So I'm interesting if you can expand on it a bit. So you reported that Fichte said that dogmatism sets up ends arbitrarily as the absolutely highest conception. I was wondering what he means by absolutely highest conception. Uh, you know, what does that mean? Uh, and I guess a, a small question, uh, you translate ends at some point as, as thing. So is that Fichte's translation? So does he say ends or the ding or something like that? Uh, so yeah, that, that's kind of it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your question. Um, ENS is, is, yes, it's Fichte's own word. He puts it between brackets when, when he speaks of the ding or a thing or um, substance. Um, so he, he doesn't translate it, he leaves it ENS. Um, and 
regarding dogmatism, the, the, um, the idea here is that dogmatism and idealism are two opposing systems or two opposing doctrines. The difference is that idealism states, posits as a highest principle, as a, an I, an absolute self that posits itself, is not a thing but an activity. And dogmatism, on the other hand, posits a thing as the first principle a substance, God, thing in itself, whatever name a dogmatic wishes to, to give his, his or her first principle, but it's always uh, something that is existent and um, transcendent to consciousness. Thank you. I don't know if, if that was um, yeah, clear enough, but that, that would be like a summary of, of uh, okay. Fichte's idea of dogmatism. Yeah. So absolutely highest conception is the first principle, right? It's the same. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. And, okay. and all that follows from it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. OK, then uh, the next question uh, is from uh, Luis. Yes, so uh, thank you, Jimena. It, it, was, it was great. It was very clear. And um, I was just wondering how you see uh, Fichte's reception of Spinoza, because you mentioned uh, different positions that are not clearly compatible uh, with each other. Uh, so you mentioned the overstepping of the borders of the first principle. Then you mentioned uh, this idea of the choice of the introduction. Uh, you can choose between dogmatism and, uh, and idealism or criticism. And then you evolve to this notion of completing the system uh, and actually Spinoza does not overstep the borders. He thinks he does and Spinoza must be completed. So do you think that there is some sort of underlying unity in Fichte's or consistency in Fichte's criticism of Spinoza? Or do you think that it is, uh, he has a sort of evolving evaluation of Spinoza that will perhaps change a little bit with time, perhaps also in function of his uh, dialogues with Schelling? I don't know, yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, yes, thank you, Luis. I think that that's the key question of, of anyone concerning with this, um, with, with Fichte's reception of Spinozism, because what one finds when, when reading the texts are all these different theses, all these different positions and interpretations that are not always compatible and that actually are contradicting and they happen in the same text a few pages away. So, um, that's quite puzzling to me, and I think that's what also makes this Fichte-Spinoza relation so, so interesting and so problematic. Um, what I would answer and what is, has been my, my way of thinking about this subject for a while now is that, well, Spinoza is not always the same. For, for everyone and not always the same for Fichte himself. And in, in the time when the um, Pantheismusstreit is still very, very heavy and still um, very present in the philosophical debates of, of, uh, in, in Germany, um, Spinoza has many faces and Spinozism means many different things. So I think that Spinoza kind of works as a keyword that um, kind of condenses a lot of different interpretations. And when Fichte addresses Spinoza, he's not always addressing the same body of, of thoughts and the same um, ideas. And he's discussing not with Spinoza, but with his contemporaries. So he's discussing with Jacobi, with Schelling, with, um, with Goethe, with Herder, and they all have different views of Spinoza and Fichte is somewhat trying to build his own image and his own Spinoza and ascribe this original Spinoza some, some role in his own philosophy or in, in, the, in the process of founding and um, and justifying his own Wissenschaftslehre. So I think that the, the discussion with Spinoza is always um, kind of um, 
transversal and is never with only one position, but it's with many at the same time. And that would be maybe a, a way of thinking of why Spinoza has so many different faces in, in Fichte's work. Although one must also admit that these theses about Spinoza are present throughout Fichte's whole life. And even in the later versions of the Wissenschaftler, we find the same, the, the same claims about Spinoza. So it's like maybe this multiple Spinoza is present throughout Fichte's work and throughout Fichte's life. And he never comes to, to a simplified version or to one aspect or one final version of what Spinoza means to him. So, well, the, the problem remains and it's very, I think it, it's, it, it's really interesting and it's very rich and, and what allows us is to reflect on, on how Fichte thinks that a philosophical system should be justified or should be founded or grounded. And the discussion with Spinoza is always some part of this process of grounding his own philosophical pro proposal. So well, there, therein lies this, uh, well, the, the, the centrality, the importance of, of the discussion with Spinoza. Yes. Okay, uh, yeah, so that's, um, I think, um, a good point to uh, conclude this part. And so uh, let's turn over to uh, Esma and her paper on, uh, on Fichte and Leibniz. Uh, yeah, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, Karin and Luis Felipe Garcia for the organization, uh, for inviting me uh, for this workshop. And I also like to thank Professor uh, Brazil to accept and comment uh, my uh, paper. Now, uh, I will be uh, talking about Leibniz and Fichte on the uh, judgment I am. Uh, Fichte mentions Leibniz here and there, but we understand his tone is not always positive. Contemporary literature on the relation between Fichte and Leibniz also mirrors the situation. In Ernest Demus, Fichte uh, praises Leibniz as immortal and says that he saw a bit more than most of his followers by endowing his monads with the power of representation. Straight off, the negative tone starts. Leibniz overstepped the circle to which the human spirit is restricted. In other words, he couldn't see that the thing would have the constituted in itself as it represents itself for itself. First, now I will examine the meaning of Hitler's phrases by showing how Descartes' reflection of I think transforms into a perception in Leibniz and how the I am appears as a distinct judgment in this transformation. Yeah. Leibniz concedes that Descartes' I think, therefore I am, is a primary truth. However, he disagrees with Descartes giving this first truth a unique significance. Leibniz's separation of truths of fact from truths of reason allows him to do so. This difference is based on Leibniz's metaphysical distinction between necessary and contingent truths. Truths of fact are contingent, and Leibniz regards Descartes' principle of cogito as a contingent truth of fact. Leibniz says these truths are numerous, and I think is not the only one of its kind. To Leibniz, one would think ourselves in I think, the object of our thought is intelligible as the object of the understanding alone. For example, to think of some color and to consider that one thinks of it are two very different thoughts, just as much as color itself differs from the eye who thinks of it. Leibniz states that as we think of ourselves, we think of being, of substance, etc., and these reflective, uh, reflective acts provide us with the principal objects of our reasoning. 
As the ideas which do not originate in sensation, they come from reflection because we carry them with us already. In latest terminology, they are innate in our minds and we are also innate to ourselves. Leighton supports innate ideas and truths, but he denies that there are innate thoughts. For thoughts are actions, and items of knowledge or truths are natural potentialities, not actualities. He says that his potentialities are always accompanied by certain actualities, often insensible ones, which corresponds to them. When I think myself, the idea of myself who thinks is intellectual, but thinking is insensible actuality. That is, the proposition I am, if not the proposition I think, is innate in us. Leibniz tries to differentiate the existence of the I from the condition of thinking. He states that to say I think, therefore I am, is not really to prove existence from thought, since the think and to be thinking are one and the same. And to say I am thinking is already to say I am. Leibniz's attitude toward cogito results in the change of emphasis to a perception because the consciousness of the I is attained via the perception. All moments of Leibniz are endowed with perception that is the representation of plurality in the simple. Now, if the I is an intelligible idea, this intelligible idea as I am is innate to ourselves and we are reflection, we have a perception. Then, love cannot be happily inferred from this fact. The judgment I am is a truth of reason, not so fast. The primary truths of reason are identities and Leibniz doesn't include I am in the axioms. He says it is a proposition of fact founded on immediate experience and is not a necessary proposition whose necessity is seen in the immediate agreement of ideas. On the contrary, only God can see how these two terms, I and existence, are connected. That is why I exist. In Leibniz's system, there must be sufficient reason for truths of fact, since existence depends upon God's decrees. But Leibniz adds that if you take axioms in a more general manner to be immediate or non-probable truths, then the proposition I am can be called an axiom. Still, there is a difference for truths of fact. For while these truths have immediacy because Nothing comes between the understanding and its object. Truths of reason have it because there is no mediation between subject and predicate. This means that in the proposition I am, God is a medium. That is, for me to be able to say I am, I need God. That triangles have three sides is a truth of reason. But Without the existence of a triangle, we have truths of reason because triangles essentially have three sides. Leibniz claims that essences can in a certain way be conceived of without God, but existence cannot be. But surely there must be an essence for Leibniz God to create me. What did God see as an essence to create me? And if I have any type of essence, and if this essence doesn't include my knowledge of myself or my self-identity, then it means God doesn't see my identity in the sense that I have all my predicates while he creates me. God cannot see the identity of a subject except as a logical rule, like Judas is Judas. However, Leibniz thinks that characteristic of essence cannot be applied to individuals. He even says that because individuals cannot be distinctly conceived, they have no necessary connection with God, but are produced freely. For him, God, uh, God has been inclined toward this by determining reason, but he has not been necessitated. He, of course, tries to refute Spinoza's system here. When thought as a whole, it is not easy to follow Leibniz's philosophy consistently regarding God and individuals. 
In 1714, in a letter, they witness Leibniz complained to his correspondent, I do not see how you can deduce any supernosism from this. It is interesting that after 80 years, Fichte quotes Maimon affirmingly, quote, Leibniz system thought draw in its entirety is nothing other than spinozism. This is what Fichte understands from spinozism and spinozism. If one oversteps the I am, then one must necessarily ar arrive at spinozism. According to Fichte, the problem in Spinoza is to separate empirical consciousness from pure consciousness. Fichte notices that Spinoza poses pure consciousness in God, who is never conscious of himself. This amounts to saying that the empirical subject of thinking is never conscious of itself, but only for another. Fichte criticized Spinoza that for him, the I does not exist purely and simply because it exists, but because something else exists. Now, is Fichte right to think that Leibniz philosophy is a version of Spinozism? Let's look at if this accusation is valid for Leibniz. Leibniz criticized Spinoza because he gave God thought, but not understanding. For Leibniz, God has not only understanding, but also perception, that is representation. What about God's a perception of himself in Leibniz? Probably Leibniz wouldn't deny it for God. But how can God see or perceive my a perception if he has an a perception at all? Now, there is a tension between the knowledge of a monad's I am and God's knowledge about this very same I am. If God doesn't have a perception, and if he can perceive my perception, God would be me. Myself, a perceptive soul, can't be present in God because if it were, I would be God and God would be me. We have already arrived at Spinozism. Like Spinoza in Leibniz system, we cannot hold our pure consciousness or a perception consistently in the presence of God. I think there is another reason than Spinozism that eases Fichte to attack Leibniz, that's Kant's destroying the argument of, necess of the necessary God. For Leibniz, God is necessary for the existence of contingent beings. But this claim is valid if only there is a God. Kant directly aims at uh, Leibniz's reasoning when he refused the ontological proof in the critique. According to Kant, being in the judgment God is, is a logical predicate. But says Kant, existence is a determination. It is not only a logical predicate that was already included in the concept. In Kant's critical era of philosophy, the role of Leibniz God as a sufficient reason for existence is undertaken by the application of categories to sensibility. Then what happened to contingence of the judgment I am? In the theoretical philosophy, Kant removes the unique existence of God, but his system is, uh, also results in a problem for the existence of I am, and it is not understood empirically. Kant accepts at least two types of I, an empirical I and a logical I. The empirical I is the I of I axis that is included in the empirical I think. The logical I is the I of I think and I am that accompanies all our representations. The logical I is easy to understand at a certain point when the object of our thinking is different from ourselves. However, when we think the very being of ourselves, Kant's statements start to be not graspable. Logic abstracts from all content and it abstracts from I am. To be able to assert an existence to the I, we have to apply sensibility and categories to the I. When we apply this, we will have the empirical I. But what this I who applies these categories Kant becomes more obscure, uh, I'm quoting, in the consciousness of myself, in mere thinking, I am the being, Vazen, itself, about which, however, nothing yet is thereby given to me for thinking. The being of the I here is more than a logical grant, 
but less than an empirical being because nothing is taught in its being yet. Still, in Kant, when we talk about per a, per a perception, it is analytical. I quote Kant, now this principle of the necessary unity of a perception is to be sure itself identical, thus an analytical proposition. Quote ends. We cannot find another way to relate self-consciousness other than the logical I. The I is logically self-identical with itself. When Fichte mentions Kant after establishing his first principle by saying that Kant gestured toward his proposition as the foundational principle of knowledge, he probably thinks of the quote above mentioned. And Fichte, like Leibniz, Fichte doesn't see thinking in Descartes' principle as substantial for the existence of the I. Before the Yana Wissenschaftslehre, we already see in the My Own Meditations of Fichte that Fichte removes thinking from the formula. He says, Ponome existentem ergo existo, nih cogito ergo sum. In the Yana Wissenschaftslehre, Fichte, uh, Fichte explicitly refuses the essentiality of thinking. Leibniz offered a perception as a pivotal for the self-conscious I. And similarly, Fichte proposes his concept of fact act, that's Tathandlung, instead of, cogito, of the cogito. The fact act describes I am. The meaning of I am as a fact could be seen originated from Leibniz's analysis of it as a truth of fact. The same property is retained in Kant's empirical I. And the meaning of I am as an act, the handlung, seems to originate in Kant's acts of spon uh, spontaneity, that is, unity of a perception. Fichte is right when he writes that dogmatic philosophy doesn't elevate itself to the pure absolute I. And Leibniz is not immune to this criticism. Now, I will give three reasons for this. One, even though Leibniz sees the principle of identity and non contradiction as the same, he interprets the I am in terms of the principle of contradiction and not in terms of identity. There could be different reasons for him not to do so. One of the reasons is that I exist is not in the form of an identity. When we think of the contradictory opposite of the proposition I exist, it would be I don't exist. But the force of opposition is not coming from a logical contradiction. Leibniz's philosophical system was well founded enough to support that I don't exist could be seen as true in a possible world in which I don't exist. It could be contradictory if it were an identity as firm as I am I, as subject and predicate. When Fichte raised I am I as the first absolute principle, we have both conditions of identity and non-contradiction in the sense of lightness because I am not I is a contradictory opposite of the identical I am I, also as the form. I am I is identical as subject predicate. Fichte's mode is crucial. Neither Leibniz nor Kant use I am I as a specific proposition, even though they had it implicitly. And it is more than a logical identity that Kant saw but couldn't constantly establish. Two, in my view, Leibniz paved the way for Fichte when he was forced to derive existence of the I from I think as I am. But he stayed in the context of his era to understand it in a relation to a creator. I am as a condition by God in Leibniz. God's creation is a relational act for the I, not an act of the I in itself and for itself. Even though we understand creation as positing like pre-critical Kant, it is still relational and conditioned by a foreign element. Peter's I has the kind of necessity Leibniz God had. When something posited in the I, it will be posited first by the I as equal to itself. Like if God existed, our identity will be posited by him 
he put the identity relationally for the things outside us. The I also can posit itself in itself and for itself via a fact act. When we posit any A as equal to A, existence doesn't follow immediately. But when the I posits its identity or equality from the positing of I am I, existence immediately follows. The existence of the absolute I is necessary for this relational act in me and for me. Necessity was unique to God before Kant destroyed it. I assume that this uniqueness is occurred by the I in Fichte. Let me reiterate what is unique in the I am. Triangle is triangle. God is God and I am I. All are analytic and are all judgments of identity. They are logically necessary truths. But from this necessity, we cannot deduce that God exists or that a triangle exists. But for I am I, there is more than a logical truth. For ontologically, only I am I includes the existence when it is a fact act. My pure perception adds existence, the proposition I am I, that is there is more than agreement which is the case for any random A is A. Three, Leibniz philosophy is mainly logic oriented and necessity was understood in a logical character. The self-identity of subjects was understood as logically valid, even though his philosophy, is, uh, his philosophy offered more than this. Fichte considered logic as empirical and not the source of necessity. Logic is certain, but the Wissenschaftler is necessary because of the acts of the I. Fichte also transforms Kant's logical analytic analysis of the I, which is a Leibnizian effect on Kant, I think, into a static character. Logic cannot produce the absolute I. The I as a fact act can produce logic. In my opinion, this is alluded already in Leibniz when he propounds that logic and identity is provided when I consider myself. Now, uh, I find Fichte's philosophy in one sense that the last point of Descartes' philosophy, if we carry it forward, we are the improvements of other philosophers. Because also in Descartes, the necessity and certitude is included in I am. But Fichte is not a Cartesian in another sense because he puts freedom before existence. Even though Leibniz tries to free his concept of a perception from the determination of thinking, we can understand that he prioritized existence via demonstration of I exist by God's decree instead of cultivating the judgment I am. It's, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Esma. Um, that was uh, a challenging paper, yes, because you deal with a very abstract subject. Uh, so um, I look forward to um, uh, Daniel Brazil's comments. Can you please unmute yourself? Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. I don't know how that happened. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very interesting and challenging paper. Uh, I, I basically agree with what you have to say uh, in the paper. I, I nevertheless have a few questions, but but I, I certainly I particularly liked what you had to say about uh, how Fichte's eye uh, resembles Spinoza's God. Your second your second point at the at the end I think was 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 really very good and important, and I congratulate you on that. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, question about Fichte. What do you mean by saying Fichte thought logic was empirical? I don't under. I don't get that. Uh, uh, it is at the beginning of he compares his first principle. He starts with the logical uh, principle, but uh, he says logic is empirical. I uh, I can go and check it. Also in 
the background of the uh, Wissenschaftler, this concept of Wissenschaftler, where he compares philosophy and logic, and he thinks uh, logic is uh, empirical. He, he, he uses this. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall that. He certainly says logic is derived and not fundamental, right? The, the, yeah. This, is a foundation of logic, but it's an a priori derivation. So I, I really, I'm not, I'm not aware of any place where he calls. Uh, logic. Yeah, I, I, I think it's. Uh, I have to double check it, but okay. uh, I, 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 he, he says in a okay. way that right. logic. I, I just don't recall it. I'm surprised. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I should, I should check the where exactly he, uh, he says this one. Sounds like John Stuart Mill yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, about Leibniz. Two questions. Uh, where are they? I'm a little disorganized here this morning. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Could you? This is just to ask you to elaborate on a point that you made. When you were discussing Leibniz's Spinozism, you say, if God doesn't have apperception, and if he can't perceive my apperception, God would be me. My self-apperceptive soul cannot be present in God because if it were, I would be God and God would be me. I don't quite under. Could you just explain what that means? How? Uh, it's I, I, I thought it's in uh, also in the uh, way of Spinoza's God. It's just like Spinoza's God doesn't have a perception, or uh, I mean, Spinoza says it uh, has pure a perception, but uh, empirical a perception are, are are the individuals, but. When we uh, transform it to lightness understanding, if God has a, per a perception, it cannot have a, per a perception of mine. If right. God doesn't have a, per a perception, and if I have per a perception, it's like if I, uh, I am present, because in lightness system, these uh, essences are present in God in a way. If my a perception is present in God's, uh, in God, and God doesn't have an, a perception. A perception is uh, like uh, more than uh, not having a perception. And if I have a perception, it seems I'm in a way uh, the God myself, not because uh, God must be uh, in a sense creating me, having the, a perception, a kind of a second order maybe a perception he has a perception and I have a perception, but it doesn't have, if, if he doesn't have a perception and if I have a perception and if I am in the gut because uh, lightness use essences are uh, in the gut, it, 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 it's in a way I, 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 am, uh, I am in the gut and I am in a sense gut. That's well, my you, understanding. Are you suggesting that perceiving something is the same thing as being something? What you say is if God were to perceive uh, it's, it's, it's not directly that uh, in a total sense, I am God, but in the sense, in a pantheistic sense, I am in the God is and God is in me. It's just like I'm understanding in that way. Not directly, I am a, a, a God, but God is in me and I am in the God. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Where's your Oh, you say uh, you also say that the role in Leibniz's philosophy, uh, God, the role of Leibniz's God as a sufficient reason for existence is undertaken in Kant's philosophy by the application of the categories of sensibility. I sure don't understand how categories of sensibility can produce existence for Kant. You got to have you got to have intuition for existence. Oh, huh? is, is it for God? Uh, maybe it's, uh, my uh, phrase is not uh, good to. Uh, uh carry my ideas. I am saying only that normal existence was possible with a Leibniz creation, Leibniz uh, God's creation, but in Kant, when we claim uh, existence, it is only in the way that we apply categories to sensibility. It's not related to God. Just the sufficient reason for existence was God in Leibniz and now sufficient reason for the existence in uh, Kant's philosophy is applying categories. I think I see what you mean, but I believe it would be clearer to say that uh, the sufficient reason for existence is sensible intuition in Kant's philosophy, not the application of categories. The application of categories- I think it's uh, because this in the table of uh, categories, this yeah. existence is a modality, a category, and we have to apply this uh, 
category, is, to sensibility, to claim existence. If existence were a category, Kant couldn't refute the ontological argument. The whole point of his, of his refutation is that existence is not a category. I think. I think it's. I think he's talking to different things in the way that we cannot just say something is, and because we say in a judgment something is a categorically, we use this existence. That means it exists. He only says that we have to use categories to the sensibility to be able to claim and in a, uh, the like I said, modality, just possibility, existence, and impossibility. They are categories and we have to apply these categories to sensibility to be able to claim existence. And in case of God, it's not sensible and we cannot apply it. We can use in a judgment as exist or existence. It's, it's a logical claim, but we have to use this category of existence to sensibility. That is the uh, interpretation what I understand from okay. Kant. All right, fair enough. Uh, one last point. Uh, what do you make of the uh, passage, the famous passage about Leibniz in the second introduction to the attempt at a new presentation in which, uh, this is section 10 of it, in which uh, Fichte says that the only philosopher in history who could have been convinced of his own philosophy was Leibniz. The only one, not Kant, right? Uh, why? <laughs> why? Uh... I, I, uh, I, I had to uh, think about it again. I, I don't know what he meant there. I don't know the answer either. I'm, I'm asking. I'm yeah, asking. yeah I, I, I will think about it. I will check it. Uh, let, let me see. It's just, I think I was reading uh, it, but I, I didn't have time to think uh, again. In second introduction, introduction, you say, right? Sometimes yeah. it, this discussion is, I'm so lost what he's talking about sometimes when I read. Yeah, here, here, here's, here's, here's what he says. He yeah. says, uh, uh, mm, if supreme facility and freedom of spirit are evidence of conviction, if skill in accommodating one's own way of thinking in every form, in applying it in an unforced way to every part of human knowledge, in easily dispersing any doubts that might arise, and in general, in employing one's system more as an instrument than as an object, is evidence of conviction, then, if open-mindedness, cheerfulness, and a good-natured approach to life provide evidence that a person is one with himself, then perhaps Leibniz was convinced, the only ah. convinced person in the entire history of philosophy. Great ah. passage. I love it. Okay, okay. I think I understand it like uh, the, it's, you know, Fichte always talks about uh, someone chose a philosophy dependent on his character or, or mm -hmm. what he understands from freedom. And what I understand from is like lateness is so so cheerful and his philosophy is so harmonic and cheerful and as a system I mean that harmony really uh, he also praises this Spinoza system and unit of system but in other way I think lateness system in this his character is so I think can be preferable to Spinoza system, even we think. I, I understand it based on character, not really so much the philosophical ground. Yeah, the problem with this is that he also says that Leibnizium properly understood is Spinozism, right? Yeah. So hard, it's hard, <laughs> yeah, it's hard but, to but, but, but I think it's like this problem uh, is, I think in his philosophy, we can understand this, but there's also, uh, we don't have to understand it. That's Leibniz's problem. I, I mean, he's not that systematic like Spinoza to say, no. okay, it's just the last comment on Leibniz. We, there are some other texts of him. It's really confusing and we can comment in another way, I think. Thank you. I, I should, I should um, thank you very much, two of you, Esma and uh, Daniel, for this interesting uh, exchange. Uh, so we now have like uh, five minutes or so uh, for uh, Q&A. So please raise your hand if you have a question. Pavel? Uh, thanks very much, Esma, for that. Uh, just really quick, this claim that Leibnizian or Leibniz is a Spinozist or Leibnizian is Spinozism. Um, so you pointed out some similarities between Leibniz and Spinoza, but that doesn't necessarily make Leibniz an instance of Spinozism. Um, this, this kind of idea that um, that all dogmatism is an instance of spinozism. It, it it doesn't. I never really grasped it, right? So if you say, even if it is a perfect exemplar of dogmatism, that doesn't make every other dogmatism an instance of spinozism. It it always seemed to me something that 
you know, Jacobi kind of released into the ether as a kind of provocation or exaggeration, and then everybody uncritically repeated it. So is there any sense, in any more precise sense in Fichte, or that you think, um, in which you think that Leibnizism or any other kind of dogmatism is a spinicism? Uh, let me, I mean, in, like I said to Professor Brazil, I think, here, what I was working on, what Fichte thinks about Leibniz and his Spinozism, and it is fair enough for Fichte to say Leibniz is Spinozis when we see his arguments. But when I, uh, okay, uh, when I look as a uh, total, I think not, uh, I don't know, when we look uh, from the aspect of this poor consciousness, poor uh, perception, I find Fichte right. But like I said, if uh, we, I think Leibniz philosophy is a kind of, uh, there's a that tension. He tries to save the God, but he tries to also make a philosophy, really uh, interesting philosophy. And if uh, in that part, he seems like individuals and these type of things are not so related to God and he's so confused, not confused, but he seems in, in, in way between. And, if we see as a whole to his philosophy, we can not directly say it is uh, definitely Spinozism. I wouldn't say that. But here, the argument's sake, I think Fichte's point is in our favor. That's okay. Um, um, uh, Jimena has a question as well. Yes, thank you. Well, really, really, really quick, maybe a short comment on this. This, this idea that Leibniz is uh, deep down a Spinozist. It's also one of the main interpretation of, of Spinozism that are going around in the period. And it's not maybe Fichte's idea, but someone else's idea, Mendelssohn's, and he's discussing with, with that interpretation. And Maimon's, he quotes uh, Maimon, but that's just a comment. My question was about this uh, idea that as Spinoza's God is Fichte's eye. If you could say something something more, and um, if uh, you had some, some more insights on that, thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, what can I... Uh... I can say more could be like the method uh, Spinoza uses is so, I think it's a kind of clue for Fichte to uh, find uh, his system as a really very systematic system. And when we just take the God and we, we leave the, uh, the only eye here, there, it's just a really easy way. I think if Spinoza didn't uh, just uh, give this frame, for the philosophy, for Fichte, it will be really, really hard to be able to make that move. And just also this understanding of necessity and understanding of the uh, this contingent things necessarily being in a, a God's, uh, as a total system. It's just like having the I as, I mean, it's already in Leibniz monodol monads, you can see that one, but Leibniz monadology is in a way not that systematic like Spinoza's. That's why, I mean, it's just, there are some clues and I see so similar to their approach to that one. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I, I'd like to, um, to interrupt you and, and conclude this uh, part in view of the time, but maybe you can uh, uh, discuss this point uh, further. Uh, so um, uh, we now turn to our uh, third and final speaker, uh, Lara Scavia, and she'll um, uh, discuss Fichte's view on uh, Bildung, etc. Please. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much again for the invitation and for you for being here and taking the time to listen to me. I would just share the screen since I have some quotations. Um, does it work? I think so, right? Yeah. Um, well, before starting, um, I wanted to um, tell you why the notion of building and education is so important for me. Uh, I'm working 
at the University of Warsaw in a project called Locality of Reason. And we are dealing with a huge problem, namely the following. On the one hand, the notion of reason carries an intrinsic tendency to universality, uh, which is, on the other hand, very difficult to be reconciled with its local, cultural, historical, anthropological background and actualization. And I cannot believe that um, the stress on the importance of learning as dimension of reason can somehow um, be helpful to um, approach the relation between universality and particularity. What I did was focusing um, mostly on Kant and, um, and recently on some modern contemporary Arabic philosophy, so a very different locality of reason. Um, and what I will present here uh, is a part of a paper um, in which I focus on the uh, notion of reason as being humble in the sense that it must be regarded as included in this dynamic of learning and of processing. Um, and the paper was on Kant and Fichte, but here I will just um, focus on the part on Fichte. Um, well, as you know, uh, education plays an important role um, in Fichte from his early lectures and writings. But it is in the vocation of the scholar uh, that can be read as a reply to Rousseau that we um, find the most relevant um, uh, references to uh, this topic. Um, but before answering um, the question concerning what is uh, what do we mean by vocation of the scholar? Um, I find helpful just to remind uh, what does vocation mean, so the stimmung, and um, what is uh, Fichte's um, definition of the vocation of men in general. So vocation, um, which is uh, the translation of this hardly translatable term in German, which is Bestimmung, um, as uh, refers to the task, meaning, purpose of human existence and can be uh, understood differently depending on the underlying anthropology and metaphysics of our given theory. And Bestimmung is often regarded as Selbstbestimmung, namely self-determination. Um, that is the human ability to act according to his own inside. And this determination is practically characterized. So the subject does not only operate purely theoretically determining his own purposes, but he applies them uh, to himself. And in this way, he defines himself in practical terms. Um, the um, vocation of men, um, to Fichte, is the unity with oneself. As we can find in this uh, quotation, uh, man should always be at one with himself. He should never contradict his own being. The termination of the empirical ego should be such as may endure forever. Am I here express the fundamental principle of morality in the following formula? So act that thou must look upon the dictate of thy will as an eternal law to thyself. So the ultimate vocation of every finite rational being is as absolute unity, constant identity, and perfect harmony with himself. Um, this um, ultimate vocation uh, requires a constant improvement. And so this vocation is not to be regarded as something that uh, can be achieved. Um, as um, Fichte puts it, uh, it is a part of the idea of man that his ultimate end must be unattainable. The way to it, it is endless. Hence, it is not the vocation of man to attain this end, but he may and should constantly approach nearer to it. And thus the unceasing approximation to this end is his true vocation as man. That is, as a rational but finite, essential but free being. As you can see, um, this formulation uh, reminds us of Kant. So Fichte is in dialogue with Kant. Um, 
supported uh, or rephrased the categorical imperative by referring to the principle of morality describing the um, vocation of men. Um, and it also kind of uh, refers to uh, the uh, maxims of the common human understanding presented in the uh, critic of the power of judgment. Uh, in particular, I would say the third one, which is the uh, maxim of consistent way of thinking. Um, but I will not delve into this here. Um, well, to Fichte, Mm. The way in which we have to strive for this unattainable end is in society. A man is not isolated or set apart from all relation, um, but um, it is characterized by a fundamental impulse. Um, in, uh, I quote, the social impulse belongs to the fundamental impulses of men. And impulses, I think it shouldn't be regarded in the, um, as it is a natural impulse. It's mostly a kind of a sort of invitation or something that one should strive for. And it is men's vocation to live in society. He must live in society. He's not complete men, but contradicts his own being if he lives in a state of isolation. And this, again, is very close uh, to Kant because um, I think it is in the um, metaphysics of morals, uh, Kant um, writes about the uh, duty not to isolate oneself. So we need the others to realize our capacities, in particular uh, the moral ones. But Fichte, perhaps slightly differently from Kant, emphasizes uh, with more um, clearness, I would say, the uh, reciprocity of such dynamic. So um, the social impulse um, is realized in the praxis as, I quote, again, a reciprocal activity, a mutual influence, a mutual giving and receiving, mutual suffering and doing. So this idea of entering um, social dynamism governed by this principle of reciprocity and coordination. And uh, within this perspective, we make ourselves free insofar as, as we make others free. Um, well, since I spoke about uh, society, um, we should spend, I should spend a couple of words on, uh, on Rousseau. As we all know, when we think about Rousseau, he's the champion of this idea of society as something that um, enchained us because uh, it puts us in a sort of a dimension of dependency in which we um, have feelings such as resentment, jealousy, amor prop against compassion and um, pity. Um, in, uh, in this framework, uh, what one should do is to educate himself uh, in a negative way. And this negative um, description of education can be found in the Emile, uh, in which nature can be regarded as the best teacher. Uh, so what the teacher, the educator, has to do is just to... Um, um, for men to help uh, the child's natural development and capacity and to encourage him in the discovery. And, um, but this, I think, is somehow close to Fichte because uh, it's um, an emphasis on, the, uh, on freedom in the end. So education is not something that uh, constrains but uh, should lead us to, uh, to free ourselves. Um, so, um, who is the scholar? The scholar um, is described by Fichte uh, as an example, and this um, is also of Kantian reminiscence. Um, I quote, he only is free 
who would make all around him free likewise, and thus really make them free by a certain influence, the sources of which are other though undiscovered. In his presence, we breathe more freely. We feel that nothing has power to oppress, hinder, or confine us. We feel an unwanted desire to be and to do all things which self-respect doesn't forbid. And later on, but no one can successfully labor for the moral improvement of his species who is not himself a good man. We do not teach by words alone. We also teach much more impressively by example. And everyone who lives in society owes it a good example because the power of example has its origin in the social relation. Um, so the teacher is described as someone who has the capacity to inspire his fellows to always be, um, to always treat the other with respect. Um, and uh, he doesn't, um, so the teacher doesn't dictate or provide imperatives, but uh, he um, leads us towards the good way by his own uh, conduct and way of being. Um, so this again reminds us of the uh, categorical imperative and to treat the other um, always as ends and not only as means. And Fichte um, stresses uh, this point by saying that not only one should uh, not use others as means, but also that uh, we should never use them for attaining their own virtue, wisdom and happiness against their will. And that one quote, must not even desire to do it, for it is unjust, and by so doing, he uh, would be placed in opposition to himself. So to respect others means to respect their freedom, even in the most difficult case, when we want them to be happy and believe we know what is best for them. But this, in Fichte uh, perspective, would only cause damage to our loved ones, insofar as we, as we would put them in opposition to themselves, to their own freedom. So one could encourage the other, share his point of view, but never force him in a specific direction because it would be a violation um, of their freedom. Um, so freedom um, is strictly related to um, education and to, it, we could say it is the goal uh, of education intended as Bildung. And again, just a footnote on uh, uh, what I mean uh, by Bildung. Uh, it's hard to distinguish the um, uh, Bildung and Erziehung, but I will just uh, give you a, a couple of um, words on that. Uh, so while um, the first one, can Erziehung, can be regarded as education in general and um, is more um, externally uh, governed, uh, we use uh, Erziehung also in relation to animals, not only to, to person. Bildung um, has to deal more with the formation of the personality and uh, needs an active internal involvement of the subject. Um, Bildung um, in, uh, in Fichte uh, is um, characterized in a manifold way. Um, for instance, it is an indefinite process and it doesn't uh, concern um, content but uh, regards the development of human capacities and reason. And moreover, uh, it is guided by the idea of harmony. Uh, we saw it previously, this harmony between the rational senses on nature of human being. and has to be realized through our action in the world. And it is realized in um, the social dimension, in the mutual and reciprocal relation between individuals who help each other to develop their own talents. This reciprocal dynamic uh, in which education consists is described um, by Fichte by the distinction between two kinds of um, impulses, the communicative and the receptive. Uh, the communicative is the one in which the teacher is the giver. Uh, he share um, his culture, he give us his example, um, but on the other hand, uh, the teacher himself is always a receiver. So everyone is always a receiver uh, because 
to Fichte, um, the second impulse, um, which is the most important, um, leads us to progress. And uh, it, I say that everyone is a receiver because um, I believe that Fichte means that nobody uh, can be so advanced in his uh, self-realization to regard others as if he couldn't learn anything from them. Um, but the scholar um, has perhaps this, um, this different perspective um, in um, comparison to uh, his pupils because um, he sees he kind of sees or presents the whole picture and not in the relation uh, between um, the variety of elements. I quote again, um, he sees not merely the present, he sees also the future. He sees not merely the point which humanity now occupies, but also that to which it must next advance if it remains true to its final end and do not wander or turn back from its legitimate path. So, in this respect, the scholar is the guide of human race. So the scholar is an example and is a guide. Um, so from this perspective, um, the scholar has a peculiar role, which consists in humanizing or ennobling mankind because um, he uh, supervised progress. He encouraged and helped people to recognize their need and serve as a living example, not separated from uh, society and from practical reality, but in the community. And in this way, politics, of course, assumes a primary role in this um, framework. And what characterizes the vocation of the scholar um, is not um, that he's an asset or uh, separated in an ivory tower, but uh, rather he's uh, really engaged and involved um, in, in life, in, in the actual problem of society. And um, discussing the uh, constitution of a perfect state in which new university would be constituted respecting the freedom of the members, Fichte writes that uh, students would be given the possibility to place themselves in a social class, uh, or scholar, for instance, by their own effort. And this project, opposes the idea of a passive school system. Um, and this, again, I think is close uh, to Rousseau. Um, in a passive school system in which uh, students must be acquainted only with content um, and being erudite in, uh, in some specific fields of knowledge. Um, on the contrary, being uh, a true scholar uh, means um, to be in possession of the idea. Um, I will quote uh, from uh, the vocation of the scholar. This principle uh, pervades the conduct of the true scholar. He has no other purpose in action but to express his idea and embody the truth which he recognizes in his world or work. No personal regard, either for himself or others, can impel him to do that which is not required by this purpose. No such regard can cause him to neglect anything which is demanded by this purpose. His person and whole personality in the world have longer since vanished from before him and entirely disappeared in, in his effort after the realization of the idea. The idea alone impels him. Where it doesn't move him, he rests and remains inactive. It does nothing with precipitation and so on. Um, so um, we could say that the scholar um, has also the task to make the idea um, accessible and so uh, to spread uh, the Wissenschaftslehre. And in this sense, um, the um, controversial text, um, the addresses to the German nation regards um, philosophy as a mean for education. Um, I will just give you the last quotation. Um, the Wissenschaftslehrer 
will become universally comprehensible and easy to understand just as soon as it becomes the main goal and deliberate aim of all education from the early stage, only to develop the pupils in their energy, and not to channel it in any anticipated direction. It demands just as soon as we begin to educate human beings for their own purposes and as instruments of their own will and not as soulless instruments for the use of others. Education, building of the whole person from earliest youth. This is the only way to propagate philosophy. Um, now, I will just give you some points for, for the debate. Um, one, uh, as I already pointed out, the dialogue uh, between Fichte, uh, Kant and Rousseau. There are several uh, elements in this dialogue, so social dimension, the role of nature, self-activity, freedom, morality, the notion of reason as being practical and so on. Uh, and another question that I have, um, and, and it is still open for me, is how can we avoid that this um, learning to be at one with oneself uh, will just um, be identified with uh, uniformity? So uh, in, in education uh, and in general, in uh, uh, multicultural society in which uh, we are living, uh, this is an issue. So thank you for <laughs> for your patience <laughs> and attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lara. This, that was very interesting and also very well uh, timed. Uh, so, um, Daniel, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, thank you again. Thank, thank you very much for the paper. I think it is right on target. I do have a question uh, about the last, uh, well, the next to last uh, passage that you quoted. Uh, there seems to be a tension between two theses. One is that uh, the business shops lira will help to contribute to human building, that mm -hmm. people will be improved. I mean, you, you made that point, right? That the scholar, uh, that, uh, but then the passage you read said the business shops lira presupposes the builder to mention presupposes people who are who, who, who have already been properly educated. How do you reconcile those two? Uh, yeah. Um, because I mean, in the German text, there is this difference between um, Erziehung and Bildung. So in the first part uh, of the quotation, uh, it says the Wissenschaftslehrer will become universally comprehensible and easy to understand just as soon as it becomes the main goal and deliberate aim of all education. Um, and then in the last part, it is education, building of the whole person from the world is here. This is the only way to propagate philosophy. So perhaps it's given too much importance to this distinction, but I think that one should become the other. And to make these passages, so to um, to uh, build the person, we need the Wissenschaftslehrer, because otherwise it will be just uh, uh, an, an education in, in the old style intended, so not at, uh, as a, um, attend and um, yeah, and help to uh, free uh, oneself. Well, I agree. I agree that Victor is committed to that view. He says it over and over again. That, uh, uh, for example, in the Zonenklub Bericht, you know, it talks about all the great things that the Wissenschaftslehrer is going to accomplish. Right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. It's going to help us become a better society, better individuals. But he also frequently says what you alluded to in the other passage that you can't understand the Wissenschaftslehrer unless you already have a lively sense of your own freedom or already gebildet or already cultivated. It seems that we're caught up in a circle. Um, yeah, unless we um, we somehow hope that the guide of the scholar and the teacher actually um, help and fulfill its aim, because it it probably uh, can be that um, I'm not uh, build it, I um, do not uh, have access or interest in the Wissenschaftslehrer, but perhaps. By the um, contact and the engagement with the scholar, I this can somehow uh, 
enlighten me and or at least um, yeah provoke me uh, and then I will start to uh, get acquaintance with it and and choose okay I want to be a free person <laughs> okay uh, so is is the the primary role of the Galeta, or the scholar here then is not to uh, share with the community or with society his specialized or her specialized knowledge but just to be a paragon of humanity a great fellow is that what the idea is i think that the one can hopefully uh implies the other uh -huh. uh, because in i said it previously uh um fichte focuses on this exemplar um idea of, of the scholar and i think that um they are uh, the one we cannot force someone uh, but uh, still uh, we can encourage someone and, and yeah can you can you set a great moral example and without being a scholar um, a great moral uh, i mean can you, can you can you do this can you be an educator can you can you be this paragon without being a scholar or must we all become galer in order to do that Good point. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? I think that there are um, some, I will try to make it simple. Um, I believe that one um, of the uh, most important features of reason in Fichte and also in Kant and perhaps one could say that they are one and the same is the categorical imperative. And you don't need to be a scholar to be a good human being. Right. Then you can ask and start to wonder, okay, what, why? Why, <laughs> why the scholar, right, yes. Yeah. Because he is one, perhaps. That's all. I have no more. I have nothing else to say. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so, um, so is there one um, pressing question right away? Uh, yes. Um, uh, Matthew, please. Yeah. Um, kind of, uh, Laura. Laura, thanks for the talk. I just wanted to hear your own thoughts on one of the questions you posed at the end. Um, about Fichte's relationship to Rousseau, and particularly on the question of just the relationship between the individual and society, I, I personally can't see any difference between Fichte and Rousseau. So I was just wondering if you thought there was any significant difference there. Thanks. I'm not an expert of Rousseau, but I'm, I'm I mean, when I started to think about the relationship between the two, I was kind of um, falsely, falsely um, influenced by a um, um, very layer way to intend society in Rousseau. But then looking at more details in, uh, in the social contract and also in the uh, Emil, I really don't see that much difference between, uh, between the two. Okay, so so you agree on this then? Yeah. Yeah. In the end, yeah. But I started from the opposite position. <laughs> okay, so um, in view of the time, I'd like to uh, uh, to conclude the formal part here. So uh, thanks again uh, to all uh, speakers. And um, thanks in particular to uh, Professor Brazil for his uh, comments and for his willingness to, to be here. Uh, it was, uh, I think, a very uh, engaging uh, dialogue with, uh, with all uh, speakers. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for this. You told us you had to leave around uh, seven. Lunch, I have to leave now, yes. Yes, so I thank think I did, I did well uh, in that regard. <laughs> Uh, so I also wanted to, for those who are going to, uh, to leave us, I wanted to uh, recall that uh, next week, also on Thursday, we have our final session of the Leuven Seminar, and we'll discuss 
a published paper on Kant's antinomies uh, by Miguel Hessens Baum. And so, of course, you're very welcome uh, to join us uh, next week. And uh, after that, we'll be back uh, in the fall. Uh, so for those who, who, who want to, uh, to go, they can go. Uh, for those who want to stay on, uh, and 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 have uh, a further um, uh, discussion, uh, please feel free to do so. And maybe there are especially some questions uh, for Lara. Bye, Daniel. Bye. Bye.